We are live. I'm admitting folks now. All right. Welcome, everyone. It looks, I think everyone is still getting admitted here. Looks like we're going to have a large group today. Um, so welcome, and thank you for joining us for this Grow With Us series. Um, just a few housekeeping things. The series uh, is recorded. So if you don't want to appear at all, uh, we suggest you turn off your camera. Um, we do ask that you stay muted, especially since we have so many people here in the meeting today, which is awesome. Everyone's excited about seeds. I know I am. Uh, so those of you just joining us, uh, I was saying, please keep your uh, stuff on mute. And we are going to be recording this session. So if you would like, you can turn off your camera if you don't want to appear. And we'll get started in just a minute. Let's look, I think, see if everyone's made it in. I think most everyone has. All right. And also, since you'll be muted, you still uh, feel free to ask questions. Um, you can just put those in the chat, and then we'll get to those as we're able to. So put any questions in the chat and all right, I guess we'll get started. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Vanessa with the Dallas Public Library. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Helen with the Dallas Environmental <laughs> Quality and Sustainability. I think I got that right this time. <laughs> and she's gonna tell you a little bit about what her organization does and introduce our wonderful um, speaker for today. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you very much. I'm very excited to be here. All right, how does that look? Does, is my presentation showing? Yes. All right, fantastic, thank you. All right, everybody, like Vanessa said, my name is Helen Dulac. I work for the city of Dallas in uh, uh, Dallas Environmental Quality and Sustainability. And we are so excited to be partnering with the Dallas Public Library on this series called Grow With Us on Mondays at noon. And I'm just gonna do a brief introduction here uh, to tell you a little bit about my department because you've probably never heard of it. Uh, we were formed back in 2004, and back then we had a different name. We were called uh, in Office of Environmental Quality, and we worked really hard for four years to help the city of Dallas become the very first city in the United States to achieve a special environmental certification called ISO 14001. What that means is it's a way to look at all of your processes so that you can still deliver service and lessen your impact on the environment. And what's it, this is an international standard, so there's big, huge companies that also have this uh, standard. But the thing is, we were the first city in the United States to achieve this. It wasn't a city in California. It wasn't a city in Colorado. It wasn't Austin. It was Dallas that did this first. So we do have a history of being green, and we just want to go greener. So let's fast forward 10 years where a lot of changes happened to this department. In 2018, there was a restructuring in the city, and uh, this department absorbed some other environmental operations and programs, and we actually doubled in size. And to reflect that change, we changed our name. That's when we became the Office of Environmental Quality and Sustainability. Also that year with that merger, we created a combined and expanded outreach and engagement team that I am a proud member of. The following year in 2019, Mayor Eric Johnson created a city council committee focused on the environment called the Environment and Sustainability Committee. They meet the first Monday of every month at nine o'clock and those meetings are open to the public. It's a great way to keep the, pul the pulse on uh, what's happening in the city when it comes to the environment. Uh, now, if you have heard of my department, it's probably because on May 27th of 2020, the city adopted officially the Comprehensive Environmental and Climate Action Plan known as CCAP. We were one of the first cities in the state of Texas to have a formally adopted climate plan. You can see all 250 pages of it at dallasclimateaction.com. It also has a lot of neat information about what you can do as an individual to help fight climate change. It is our roadmap for the next 30 years on how the city is going to work cooperatively uh, with different organizations, businesses to improve the environment for all. So I mentioned that my department doubled in size. Well, you can see those three squares in green. Those are the groups that joined us in 2018. I'm going to talk about one of those for just a moment, and that is storm water. So storm water is any time water, such as rain or from your sprinkler systems or even from a hose, travels through a surface that it cannot drain into. So when it travels over concrete, your driveway, down the street, uh, it can pick up pollution along the way. So when it rained, just like it did earlier today in that storm that probably woke us all up this morning, that water was rushing off across our lawns, down our driveways, into the street, going down the gutters, all the way to that big drain at the end of the street. Well, that drain is called a storm drain inlet, and it's there for one reason, and that is to keep the streets from flooding. So when I woke up this morning, my streets weren't flooded because of those inlets. 
It's really important to keep those clear of debris, such as leaves and lawn clippings, so they don't get clogged. Plus, you also need to think about pollution that's outside. The rain can gather that pollution and carry it into our lakes and eventually the Trinity River. And the Trinity River actually flows all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. So pollution from your, your home, from your neighborhood, from this city can actually end up in the Gulf of Mexico. So please just be mindful what you're doing outside and um, make sure that we're not polluting our environment. So I mentioned the outreach and engagement team that I'm a member of. Well, we want to empower Dallas to save the earth. And we do that by virtual presentations like this one and in-person when we're allowed. If you are in Dallas, we can present for free for your HOA meeting, for any clubs and organizations. We also have a lot of materials for students anywhere from K to college. And we can also participate in seminars, activities, and events. Um, one of the recent events that we held ourselves was back in November was the WaterWise Landscape Tour. You can actually take a virtual tour of these different homes at savedallaswater.com. And you can see many homes that actually have zero turf. They have no grass. So think about how much time you're saving by not watering and also not mowing. Uh, those are great inspiration homes. Now, if you do invite us to, to speak to your group, what do we talk about? Well, we have environmental topics from A to Z, all the way from air quality to zero waste. So with that, I wanna leave you with our website. If you ever wanna learn more about us or get some more information or green tips, please visit greendallas.net. Also, please follow us on social media so you can learn about classes like this and other things. We also have another series of classes on Thursdays at noon, uh, focused on different environmental topics. This week is going to be about electric cars. Uh, and then also we have a kids series called Earth Kids. That's going to be on Wednesday of this week. Uh, and that's for students K through 12. So we are on Facebook at, uh, at Green Dallas TX. And we are on Twitter and Instagram at Green Dallas. And so with that, I am super excited to announce our guest speaker today. She is a wealth of information. She's also the school garden coordinator for Richardson ISD. And she is a very good friend of mine. And I'm so excited to have her here talking to you about seeds and even all the different experiments she's gonna be doing with us today. So it is my pleasure to introduce Dawn Cleves. Hi. All right, I'm gonna go straight to sharing my screen. Um, back. What do we have up here? There we are. Um, so I love seeds. When they said, could you teach something about seeds? I was like, well, of course, because all other women in Dallas are collecting shoes and I'm collecting seeds. So I have seeds and I am constantly um, trying to find more. Um, and seeds are awesome because they're the hope for the future. Nature is telling us day after day, the more seeds it produces, the more there's going to be a future for us. Um, I wanted to remind you guys that Seeds are everywhere in the grocery store. So we have a couple of quick slides here to show you. You've got beans, rice, and quinoa are all seeds. People forget sometimes that rice is actually a seed. And one of my future experiments is gonna to be to grow grocery store rice, um, cause why not? Um, then we have popcorn. Popcorn is a really fun one. I have learned over the last couple of years of growing popcorn that you really need to either hand pollinate or um, plant a lot of it so that it'll wind pollinate itself. Um, wheat, your flour is from wheat and there's other grains that we also grind up for flour for baking. So that's an everyday thing. Nuts, all of those tree nuts um, that some people are allergic to um, are also seeds that will sprout and grow stuff. And sometimes if you get a whole one from the grocery store, you can grow those. Spices also, your spices are lots and lots of seeds. So when I collect my cilantro seeds, I'm saving some of that for coriander for the kitchen, mustard seeds, celery seeds, and cumin. So those are a lot of different things from the grocery store. So seeds are all over the place. We are going to go first and look at where do seeds come from? And so bear with me for a minute. I'm going to mute off of here and transfer to another camera. And so just a second and I'll pop back. Okay, can you guys hear me now? Yes, we can. Awesome, and so we need to spotlight this other camera. Did y'all spotlight it? I can't tell. Okay, well, we will work with that. 
right, so we're gonna start with, we know our life cycle of the plant and our plant comes from, there it is. Our plant comes from flowers. So you plant a seed, it grows into a plant, it sends up a um, flower, the flower gets pollinated. And then um, are we spotlight, there we are. Center, yay. So we are going to look at flowers and it'll shoot up a stem. You have a flower and we have the petals. We have the stamen, which is the male flower part with the anther and the filament. The anther is the structure that has the pollen attached to it and the pollen will come off of to pollinate the flower. And the filament is like a teeny tiny stem that holds up the anther. So that is the male part of the flower. The female part of the flower is on the other side. It is the pistil. The top of it is the stigma, which is the opening that has sticky stuff to hold onto the pollen or grab the pollen. The style is its kind of stem-like structure. And then down here is the ovary. But inside the ovary, when you have a flower, you can actually find the ovum and lots of flowers. And so I like to take the kids out when I'm working with kids at the schools and we go just smash up flowers and try to find the baby seeds before they become seeds. Um, lastly, we have the stem and the sepals. So we're gonna do a quick dissection of a paper white. So our paper whites, are blooming right now and paper whites come up totally on their own. So they're a great one to have around because there's always plenty of flowers for the whole class. This right here, this papery thing is the sepal. And so there's only one for the whole bunch of flowers. We're gonna pick this flower right here, break that off. And now let's see if we can get the camera to focus. And so we can pull open these petals. And if we pull gently, it opens the side and then we're gonna open it up more. Oop, there it's actually focusing. And you can see those anthers. And the anthers have pollen on them. So you see those little oblong things? It's focusing more on my fingers than on the flower. So those have pollen, but the center, let's see if I can get that out of here. In the middle, right there, you see the pistil. And so that is the female part of the, part of the flower. And then we smash down here and open it up. And this, can you see those little seeds inside? Those are actually the beginning of the seeds inside the ovary of the flower. So that's where seeds come from. Now seeds make all kinds of interesting structures. So here I have some poppy seed heads and poppy seed heads are fascinating because of these little windows right here. So when the seed head is green, these lay down and close those holes and it sits perfectly straight up. We're looking from above, but then when they dry, the drying of it makes the fibers in the top shrink, lifting that flap. And it's such a fascinating natural structure. And then what happens is the stem becomes brittle and it'll break and it literally like spills out seeds. And let's see, I saved one that, we'll see if it'll spill them out. There's a few, not as many. I think I already spilled them all on my floor. Oh, there they are. So you see lots of little seeds. So that one was full of seeds. And when you tip it over, it just pours out. The camera gonna, teeny, teeny, tiny seeds. So those are poppies, which are really cool. Um, we're talking now about trying to have the kids at schools plant them um, with Veterans Day, because if you plant them with Veterans Day, then in the spring, you'll have the poppies. The next one I wanna show you that's a fun structure is the butterfly weed. So butterfly weed makes these seed pods like this that are awesome. And then they open up and they have all these seeds inside and the seeds are wrapped around the center and are perfectly sta stacked so that the wind will take them and blow them away and they will plant themselves somewhere else. And then, the next one we have is the loofah. So loofah is fun. It's new to a lot of people, but anyone with Asian heritage may have heard of this one before. So it is edible and cultures in Asia eat it just like we eat zucchini. Um, it's also the same thing that becomes the sponge. So this, here's your loofah sponge, just like it would be from Bed Bath & Beyond or something like that. And if you go like this and shake it, the seeds come out. 
And so we have plenty of seeds to pat, to plant more. So I'm collecting seeds in all kinds of crazy ways. And the question becomes, are my seeds any good? So we're gonna learn how to do a germination test. So what I have is a tray here that will have to be at an angle. Um, and this is the seed packet that we are going to test. So what we're gonna do is we are going to first select a sample size of seeds. So our seed packet has you know, a bunch of seeds in there. But if we do the germination test with all of them, we won't have anything left to plant in our garden. So we just want to select enough to get an idea of whether they're worth using. So I'm going to do 10 seeds. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. I'm going to switch out that one because that one is obviously broken. We're going to put it there. Now I'm going to use a spray bottle. Oh, here's my spray bottle. And I'm going to spritz it. Now, if you're using little tiny seeds, you're going to want to spritz it gently because you can actually, the kids kind of have fun with it, but they blast their seeds across the room. So you want to gently spray it. And then we start covering it up and folding the seeds up. And we want to spray it as we go because we want it to be wet all the way through. Make sure that you don't have any dry parts. Um, and then we fold it up like a burrito. You just don't want any of your seeds to come out of it. And when you're doing a bunch of them, you can actually stack them up inside of a container. And then I like to visit the back corner of the grocery store and get myself something sweet from the day old bakery stuff. And that's gonna keep it nice and humid and moist for the time it needs to germinate. Now, when you do these, you need to research what temperature your seeds are expected to germinate at. And there's lots of charts. We're gonna look at charts later, but you're gonna see here that we have sometimes, um, you've gotta choose the right location of where to set this. If you set it down low on the floor in the corner somewhere, it may stay cooler. If you set it, um, up high on top of a refrigerator or a shelf, heat rises. And so that'll be warmer for your warm weather seats. So let's start with carrots. So here's about a week ago, I did my carrots and let's see if we can look at this. So if you look at these, right there is the only one that germinated. And then, so those were seeds from 2017. And because it's a tiny seed, I chose to do 50 seeds. Um, and the seed packet had tons. Now here, you can see 2020 seeds and a lot more germinated. So here we have our results. And so we had one germinate and that's bad. We don't even need to do the math. Here, we had 45 seeds germinate out of 50 seeds. So we're gonna go for percentages. So we multiply by our twos and we get 90 over 100 and 90% 90 germination is good germination. So those seeds are good to go and we're gonna throw out the other ones. Next we have lettuce. So there's our lettuce, small seeds again. These are from 2019, but I didn't get really good germination rates. And you can see some of them are trying, but they didn't do really well. And an interesting thing about lettuce is that lettuce needs, or it, it, supposedly it needs light to germinate. These actually germinated in the dark, but light might've helped them. Um, but these 2020, they germinated just fine in the dark. And here we can see our results for the 2019, we got 60% germination. Now the threshold is about 70. 70% 70 or above is good, 70% or below, not so good. Of course, it's always a cho choice. If you wanna try with 60% germination, you, by all means you can. Um, you just might wanna double up how many seeds you plant in order to try to get enough to do any good with. And because we used 25 seeds, we multiplied by four. So you wanna select a number of seeds to use that is 
a factor of 100. And that's why this is such a great exercise for our kids. It is. So Dawn, can I ask you a question? Yes. All right. So we have a question from Jessica. She is curious about if, if you can improve germination rate on older seeds by storing them properly. For example, does this take into account proper storage of the seeds? So if the 2017 carrot seeds have been stored in a proper way, would the germination have been more successful? It is likely, but some seeds are just only viable for a certain number of years anyway. And perfect storage is going to be humidity levels, light levels, uh, temperature levels, and what were the conditions and variables when the seed was produced during its life cycle, along with how it was collected. So you're playing a game with a ton of variables out there. And our German, the point of the germination test is that no matter how they were stored, you can see whether you want to keep them or not. Does that help? Um, it does. Thank you. And Don, you've shared some really interesting things uh, today that already, and we've just gotten started. And you're going to touch on seed storage too, right? Yeah, we talk a little bit about seed storage, um, but yeah, we'll get to that. This. Uh, There'll, there'll be several other examples of um, age versus seed storage versus whatever. Because some of the seeds, for me, my seeds, since I teach at the different schools, some of the seeds end up riding around in the car with me and getting super hot. And, um, and maybe they got left out in the rain or, you know, any number of things that are bad for seeds. So oh, good point. Good point. Okay. So we got <laughs> one more question before you move on to these. Beats. Okay. Okay. Yep. All right, is the time element in the germination test always seven days, or did you say that we need to read the package for this information? Yeah, that's a good question. So different seeds have different germination days, and it's generally gonna be on this seed packet or you can research it online. And I actually have some examples coming up where seven days was way too much and they kind of went crazy. Um, so you wanna start checking around three days um, but you're not going to count them off as being a bad germination test, you know, at three days. So some seeds won't germinate at all at three days, but if you wait till seven or 10, you'll be good. But if you read the packets, there's some seeds that like parsley takes 21 days. And so if you wait 10 days and you go, oh, they're totally not good, you're going to have missed your opportunity because those just always take longer. Um, but I am learning the more germination tests I do that even when some stuff says that it's a 21 day, some of them will germinate in seven. I mean, carrots are one of those that say that it's a 21 day sometimes. So um, it, it's quite a variable, um, but it's an experiment. So that's why it's an experiment. Fantastic. All right, Don, go ahead. And then I'm going to, when you finish with this, I have some more questions that have come up. Okay, awesome. So here we have beets. We have some from 2017 and some from 2000, uh, 2020. And when you look at the counting, I got 16 out of 20, which is 80%. And I got 16 out of 20, which is also 80%. And it's like, well, wait a minute, there's the same. But if you look at these, they're definitely not the same results. Okay, let's try to focus over here. Let's see. So you can see these are much more vibrant than these. And so that's one of the other things you should pay attention to when you're watching your seeds germinate is their vigor. And are you getting strong germinations are you, or are you getting weak germinations? Because that also matters. Oh. All right. So now we're gonna to get to some fun ones that I collected myself. So this one is one of those that went crazy. Now, if you pay attention to research, research says that these seeds should have been bad. Research told me that I only got one year for corn and there was no way these were gonna be any good. These are from 2018 and they're my own stuff from the garden. They're Cherokee rainbow popcorn and I saved them myself 
and they have been saved by throwing them in a paper bag and putting them in a closet. So nothing special about how I saved them. However, I got 19 out of 20 germination, which is great germination. And even when I was making my germination test, you'll see, here's that one that didn't germinate. And I noticed as I was popping these off the kernel, off the cob, I kind of noticed that one looked a little moldy and like it might have had some corn smut on it. So um, I probably should have thrown that one out before I did the germination test. But this is great results for these seeds. And that means I can plant them and harvest them again. All right, Don, are you ready for another question? Sure. Okay, and this one is, um, this is a really interesting question. All right, so if you, so Yvonne is asking, if you buy non-organic vegetables or vegetables that have been radiated, are those seeds inside the vegetable good and are they worth trying to grow? So for example, she bought some veggies, some non-organic veggies, and she wants to know, uh, how do you know if a veggie has been irradiated? You don't. Um, I, I, I would say you, you know nothing unless you try. And there's actually way more variables that go into this. Um, you don't know if you're dealing with a hybrid. You don't know if you're dealing with a GMO. You don't know if you're dealing with an heirloom that was picked early enough that the seeds aren't mature anyway. There's, um, there are processes that they do when they're storing produce that um, keep them from sprouting or keep seeds from being viable. Um, but sometimes you can go, I mean, you can go and just pop something in. A cantaloupe, it's generally ripe enough. So cantaloupe's one of those that tends to have good seeds, but they may be a hybrid. So you don't know what you're gonna get. You might get a mutt and it may be like the parent fruit or it may not be. Um, it, it's, a, it's one of those things where you just try and experiment. And actually watermelon is one. Um, this one I got at a farmer's market and um, I saved the seeds from the farmer market. I talked to the farmer and he said, oh yeah, this is legacy watermelon and I grow it out in the field and it does great. And I was like, great, so I saved the seeds. Um, and then I also did that with sangria watermelon and I saved their seeds too. And I've been growing them for the last probably three or four years. Um, and this year I found out sangria is actually a hybrid, which I was kind of confused because I thought I was buying, I was propagating a seed of a small watermelon. And this past year we had a 35 pound watermelon. So it didn't stay true to its original type. Um, but the legacy is an heirloom. And so it has stayed true to type and I'm continuing to get uh, results that are similar to the original. Um, this one is actually also challenging to look at because when you look at it, you find that the seed coat, this is the outer part of the seed, comes off as it sprouts. And so the first time I counted, I thought I had 12 seeds here um, with seven of them sprouting and it was because they separated off of the sprout itself and so I was actually counting the seed coat and the sprout instead of just the uh, sprout. So this one is seven out of ten which is borderline and basically I consider since they're free seeds to begin with I plant two seeds instead of just planting one seed. And we've got one more of these germination tests before we move on to the next topic. So this one is wheat and we collect our seeds ourselves. Let me actually, so here, this wheat, you can pull it apart and right there, that's your wheat berry or your wheat seed. It's focusing back there instead. So that's what I pulled out to do my germination test. Here's our germination test. It grew like crazy and I got 20 out of 20, which is 100%. So wheat did a great job.
All right, do we have any questions about doing germination tests? It looks like we've covered them all so far. <laughs> okay. Uh, there's one that um, asked, do you do the sample testing uh, every year before you plant? Uh, no. Um, it would be a nice idea, but um, I tend not to have time, um, but I pay for it later, which is why I have become more diligent about it more recently. How's that? I should, I don't. All right. Okay, John, we actually did get another question too. Yep. After you do the germination test, are those seeds wasted? Can you not plant the seeds after you've done the germination test? So that brings me to this. So some people will take their germination test. If you catch it soon enough, you can take it to your germ. You can pull them very gently out of your germination test if they haven't gotten too twisted and gnarly. And you can put them in the ground and grow them but most likely you should be doing your germination test before it is the right season to plant them because you wanna know so you have time to buy new seeds if you need to. So you shouldn't actually be doing your germination test at the right time to plant them outside. That doesn't mean you can't plant them inside. And so here's an alternative to doing germination tests is you can fill a pot full of soil and do a couple of seeds and sprinkle them and just see if they grow. And I didn't do any counting. I'm not gonna count for which, how many grew or how many didn't grow, but I consider these a success. And I also do these trays. I've got some five inch trays. These are actually not as healthy as some other ones that I did. And these are actually from the Dallas Public Library uh, seed library. And they are very healthy. So that is another option. And when you do it this way, you can break them apart and then plant them either put them in pots for a little longer if they aren't ready to go outside yet or put them directly outside after you've hardened them off. Now, some of us gardeners know that during this pandemic, we had a time where seed companies were scrambling and running out of seeds. And so the question is, how many seeds do you need? And many people do a four by foot by eight foot bed and square foot gardening is really popular. And so if you figure out your spacing, you can do intensive gardening. If something has a three inch spacing, you can fit 16 in a one foot square. Or you can do four inch spacing for nine in a one foot square. Here's six inch spacing for four per one foot and one to one. Now there's a couple of things that like to be in hills every three feet. This is how I do a four foot by eight foot bed. They're not really three feet. I kind of tuck it in a little bit, but I'll do my three hills in one four foot by eight foot bed. And then there's a couple of things, potatoes and sweet potatoes that I'll do in two rows and I'll do them every foot or every 18 inches. So there's your average spacing. Now, if you, can find my paper, hold on. So if you have beets and you think to yourself, okay, uh, how many beets do I want? I think I want six beets per week. So if I want, I can do beets, harvesting beets from mid-November to mid-May, that's 24 weeks. So I want 148 beets or 144 beets, right? Yes, I did this math in advance. Um, anyway, so you plant them on a four foot, four inch spacing. And so you can get 16 per square foot, or I guess I said three, three inch spacing. And so that's about half of a garden bed. So your four foot by eight foot bed, you would do half the bed in beets. Now, first of all, I think you're gonna get sick of beets before then. But second of all, I opened this packet and I counted and there were 450 seeds. So if I have new seeds, there's no way I need all of these seeds. And so I would say everybody, when you buy a packet of seeds, depending on the seeds and how many are in a packet, um, you should share with someone else. Uh, another thing to look at is this one, this is kale. So kale, this one has either a one foot spacing when it is um, 
planted intensely or an 18 inch spacing when it's planted to let it grow. It says that it's, there are approximately 600 seeds in a seed packet. Now, if you plant a four foot by eight bed completely with kale, which is probably too much kale for anyone, that's all the seeds you need. So you have plenty to share. So what I say is go out there, buy your seeds with friends and then share them and continue sharing so that you can always have fresh seeds. It's more important to have fresh seeds than to buy, uh, we like variety in our garden. We wanna plant, um, most of us, if we only have one or two four foot by eight foot beds, we don't want the whole bed planted with kale anyway. So sharing with seeds is a great way to go. All right. I think I have showed, oh, I've got one other last little thing. Um, just because this is weird stuff, I've got, um, this is an Asian pumpkin, which I'm collecting seeds from. Everybody knows that you just clean these up, wash them, and then let them dry on um, paper towels and you've got seeds for next year. This one is a unique guy. Um, took a saw to cut it open last night and it's a kukuzi. And I grew it for the first time this year. My plant died, but my friend's plant did just fine. And so anyway, so they gave me one to collect seeds from. I call it the armpit plant. It stinks. But many of us know that we have a squash vine borer. Squash vine borer doesn't care about this plant. And so I've been experimenting with growing this, even though I killed it, yes, uh, but growing it in and around my pumpkin or my zucchini to try to fool or trick the, um, whatchamacallit, the squash vine borer. So it's an experiment that's ongoing, but it's a huge gourd that is edible when it's young and, but definitely is not as appealing to our critters. So I'm gonna go back to my screen share on my computer. So hold on just a second. Um, do we have any questions? This is a good breaking point. All right, let me get the screen share back up. So um, Dawn, yes, so what are, what are some, some of your favorite resources that you can share uh, for uh, spacing your, your seeds and vegetables in the garden, especially for novice gardeners? So I have actually made my own. Um, I find that I am not a religious square foot gardener. I still like to do rows, um, but I kind of do more of a general spacing and the spacing tends to be based off of square foot gardening. Um, but as we go through this, we will see the spreadsheets that I have created and that I use. And um, after I'm done with this part, we will look at the new and improved version of these same spreadsheets. Um, because yes, my goal is for the novice gardeners, which are many of my school teachers, to give them all of the information they need in the most concise way possible so that they're not chasing all over the internet, which is a wild west out there and not all the best information <laughs> sometimes. So um, here we have our seed packets. We're gonna start this, um, hold on, I'm looking for my pointer so I can point for you guys. There we go. Yes, we can and see it. You can see my pointer? All right, yep. so this is a seed packet and you can see it talks about all kinds of things. And we look at this map down here and here we are. And so we kind of are in like April or June. That's where we're supposed to plant this. Well, planting outside in April and June uh, is great for your summer crop, but we also have a wonderful fall season. So the, we wanna look um, here where your pictures, your beautiful faces are covering it up. There we go. So, um, it's a warm season crop. And if you read through here, it's going to say plant, um, I'm not finding it now. It should say how far to plant it before the last frost. Um, so we are going to want as a warm season crop, 
we are going to want to plant this before um, before it gets too cold in the fall, which means you have a second planting season in uh, August, late, late August and early September. Um, early September starts getting a little late. Um, oh, here it says two week, two months before the first frost. So you start at the November 15th and you move back from November 1st, 15th, you move back to October and then September 15th. But you need time to actually have all your harvest and harvest can last about two weeks. So that takes you back to the last of August. So that's another time that they don't really, it would be hard to figure out just looking at the seed packet. Um, also, you can look at that saying harvest in 58 days. So that's also your two months before your last frost plus harvest lasts two weeks. So you wanna bump it back another two weeks. Um, so here's that spreadsheet I was talking about. So if we look here and we look at our beans, here it shows two weeks and two, two weeks in the end of August and two weeks in the beginning of September when you can plant the seeds. And then it'll grow through this part of the season. And right here should be when you're harvesting may be as late as here. And with beans, the more that you harvest, the better that they grow. And this is for school calendars. So I actually leave off the summer planting because if you planted here, oops, what happened? Oh, it was a link. I'm sorry, what are you seeing now? Uh, uh, we're seeing we'll a an spread expanded yeah. spreadsheet that also has a spacing C depth. Version. Okay, we're gonna go back to the old version. There we go. That's it. All right, so the reason that I don't have it listed here is because our kids leave school in June and they wouldn't be able to harvest it. But as a home gardener, you can plant them in the uh, spring and have a summer harvest of beans. So I hope that makes sense. So now the question is, how do I change slides without making it trigger? So this one is one that I made for home gardeners. And now you can see our bush beans are both, we plant a little earlier in August because well, you can plant them at home, but our school kids aren't back yet. So I've added a spot there and now we've added this in. So home gardeners, you can harvest in July if you plant during this time period. Um, and it's always going to relate to when you actually planted it. If you plant here, you're going to harvest earlier. If you plant in May, you're going to harvest later. Uh, and so now we're going to look at some beets. And so beets, here we are. And this one actually is nice. So it has February to April and August to October. And if we look here though, It'll say after danger of frost. Well, it's saying February to April and our last frost date is March 15th or so. And so February is actually before the last danger of frost. But the part up here, even though it conflicts with this, this is correct. And so how do we know which part of these seed packets is correct? Well, we go to a chart made by someone locally and there's a lot of them out there and you don't have to use mine um, there's uh, North Haven Gardens has them, AgriLife has them. AgriLife is going to give you recommendations to use chemical fertilizers and chemical pest control. Um, I don't, our school gardens are purely organic, so we don't follow those, but the planting calendar will be the same. So this is your school calendar one, and um, we can pause for a second. Um, any questions at this point? Absolutely. All right, so okay. Dawn, everybody is so excited about your spreadsheets and they're hoping that you will share links to those. Yes, we will be sharing those um, after this is over. And when you guys send out your email, I will put together a bunch of links. Absolutely. So what Dawn is referring to is that the everyone who registered for this session through the Dallas Public Library's website, we have your email address, of course and the library will send you an email in a couple of days that has a link for you to access this recording so you can keep it as a reference. Plus, they will include extra information uh, like these links that Dawn mentioned and any other resources that she wants to share. So there's always a benefit to registering for our sessions even if you can't make them live. You still get these resources and um, have access to the recording to watch at a later date. Of course, this recording will also be on the Dallas Public Library's YouTube page. So 
So if you have a friend who missed it, you can always send them to that YouTube page and they can see this wonderful presentation. Um, so Dawn, that's those spreadsheets you made. You have one for school gardens, you have one for home gardens. And did you say that this is from your own uh, experience? That's how you created the spreadsheet for the planting and the harvesting? It is a compilation of a lot of things. So it has, um, some of it's my own experience. Some of it is Don Lambert has his own little packet of papers that he shared with me. And so some of it's from him. Uh, Heather Rinaldi from the Texas Worm Ranch. She has a wonderful, the most concise book of gardening in North Texas that I've ever seen, which is beautiful. And so I've used some of her uh, information. I also double checked it back on uh, AgriLife and checked it on uh, North Haven Gardens just to make sure that I'm not, you know, pulling it out from left field somewhere. Um, but I tried to narrow down instead of being, I find AgriLife is overly optimistic and they plant way ahead in the middle of the summer and you're going to use a lot of water trying to get those seeds started. So I kind of cut that little off a bit and I'll go a little later. Um, so it's, it's, it's from all over. How's that? That's perfect. That's how, you know, it's, it's, it's resources that you pull together to create the best thing. So absolutely. And edit it constantly. And I've got a little more to share whenever we want to. Okay. So uh, we have a question. Have you ever successfully grown fennel? Fennel, I go from transplants and um, I have not actually started it from seed. I do hear that fennel, um, you don't want to grow fennel and dill at the same time and collect seeds from them because they will cross pollinate and you will end up with its own unique thing. And I've heard rumor that it's not the best tasting fennel or dill because it's not really either one of them. <laughs> All right, fascinating. Okay, I think, uh, what is the name of the Texas gardening book? Oh, I think they're talking about maybe Heather Rinaldi's book. Yeah, it's 365 Days of Gardening or something like that. It's on her website. Um, I bet Vanessa can find it. Yes, I think it's texaswormranch.com, I believe. And Heather does offer uh, gardening classes through her business. Uh, yes. There is a small fee for those classes, but like Dawn said, they are fantastic. And Heather is a, uh, she, she's an absolute expert and she has a, a lot of experience gardening in, in Dallas. Yes. All right. I think we're caught up on our questions. I think we're ready to move on. Okay. So I'm going to go back to the screen share. Um, here we are. So when you are getting free seeds, you got to ask, why are they free? All right. Check the dates. Know your source and the history of how they were saved, how they were stored. Um, when we talk about storage, one of the tricks I have, I have mine in a part of our house it's it's I don't put them outside for sure don't leave them in a shed um, winter may be okay but if you have a leak or too high humidity your seeds will go bad and the summer is too hot here and so that will also make your seeds go bad um, so you want them inside a controlled environment and then you want to keep them dry and depending on your house if you have humidity problems I find that I'll get some of those little do not eat things from when you buy shoes um, those little dry desiccant packets, I'll throw those whenever I get them into my seed storage. And that helps me know that they will be, um, they will not get moldy. Um, when you're saving seeds, uh, you must do the best you can to make sure they are completely dry. Uh, I have a video on my YouTube channel where we saved mustard seed and some of the seeds got kind of forgotten and left sitting in a tray because I didn't have time to store them yet. The others I neatly put in a Ziploc bag and I came back to find the ones in the Ziploc bag all moldy and had to throw them out. And the ones in the tray that I didn't actually do any storage with were fine. And so I recommend paper bags and not Ziploc bags, not plastic, um, because if you have air circulating, if if your seeds have just a little moisture left in them, that'll allow them to breathe. And of course, doing a germination test is the best way to know if the free seeds you're getting are good. Oh, hello, where did we go? All right, Don, we have another question is, do yes. you put your seeds in the refrigerator or freezer? I do not. I have a family and they would not let me. <laughs> there is, 
plenty of research out there that would say that that is a great recommendation. And absolutely, if you need to stratify seeds, that will work, um, but it's not necessary. Um, I think it's more advantageous to make sure you're getting fresh seeds than to try to store them and hold them forever. The longer you hold them, the more risk there is of them not being good. All right, good point. And you mentioned stratifying. Could you please explain that? And also someone had a question about the right way to nick seeds. To do what? To nick them, I think where you, you know, you cut ah, them. Ah, scarification. Yes, uh, scarification. That was in my original notes when I was making this lesson, uh, um, but yes. So um, I have a slide just a little bit later that I think will do at least the, um, the stratification. Nicking them, that's like blue bonnet seeds and um, scarification can either, either be done by acid or by, like you said, nicking. And if you wanna nick them, what you're trying to do is break that seed coat. So the seed coat is the protective coating of a seed and st some seeds need something mechanical or chemical to break it. And it may be that a bird eats it and it goes through the digestive tract and that acid that happens in the digestive tract or the grinding in the gizzard are going to scratch that seed coat so that, so that the seed coat can uh, break open and the seed can germinate. Uh, one thing you can do is you could take a container and you wrap the inside of it with um, sandpaper and then you put a lid on it with your seeds in there and you shake it and while you shake it that sandpaper will abrade the outside of the seed coats. I do this with the kids while we're um, we'll pass it around the class and each person well not during COVID but Pre-COVID, we would pass it around the class and each kid would get to shake the uh, container for a little bit, scratching your blue bonnet seeds. And then we would go out and plant our blue bonnet seeds. Um, so last weekend uh, with the help of Dallas Public Library, I gave out seeds to a bunch of schools, school gardens throughout the North Texas central area, both DISD, RISD and others. And we gave out 664 slide, uh, seed packets. And I don't know, the seed, the slide, I can't talk right now. The um, slideshow template had a thing that said big number. So I figured I'd put it in. Um, we did our germination tests. And so some people will say, I planted my milkweed, it didn't sprout. This is your stratification. So you've got to do research when you get seeds and you're trying to start something new. Um, Seed stratification needs a certain exposure of certain days to a certain temperature. That generally means you're gonna do kind of like your germination test, but you're going to take your burrito that is moist, that you sprayed with water that you made with your paper towel burrito and your seeds are inside. You're gonna put it in a Ziploc bag and you're gonna throw it in your refrigerator and you're gonna follow directions for how many days it needs to be there. Um, uh, scarification, we just talked about. But the other thing you can do is be lazy and just be like mother nature. Mother nature does not have a refrigerator. So what do I mean when I say be like mother nature? Well, mother nature makes the seeds on the plant. You see the dead flower, the dead plant there. And if you let it go through its natural cycle, it is dropping those seeds in the fall. And so if you throw the seeds out in the fall, and maybe step on them. If, if it's got a hard thing, you wanna step and do a little twist, um, just step on the seat, the flower head and walk away. And your natural winter should stratify them and they should germinate the next year. Um, that's what I mean by be lazy and be like mother nature. Um, so this, I got goofy. I did this late at night, I am sorry. Um, but milkweed is, Imagine the animals bumping those seed pod, pods and knocking them over and so that they um, get planted. Same thing with your poppies and then also your vines for your loofahs. So there's our loofahs at one of the school gardens. Um, and there they are when they're, um, these are actually too old to eat. You would eat them much younger. You'd want them to look like a grocery store zucchini size. Um, but these will make great sponges. Um, so I, the last thing I have is if I were to do a garden and wanted to be the most successful for this region, the top 10 seeds to direct sow, uh, direct sow means to plant in the ground, is going to be in the spring, which is from now. Some of these start as early as February 15th. 
um, peas, kale, lettuce, beets, parsley and cilantro, cilantro and parsley, those can go in the ground right now. Um, in summer, if I wanna be successful here in Texas, I do watermelon, loofah, cucumbers, beans, both pole beans or um, bush beans and basil. So there's my top 10. And- Okay, Don, before you move on, when yeah. you're talking about peas, what type of peas, like snow peas, sugar snap peas? Yes, um, both of those are good ones. Um, there's a few that have extended seasons, uh, but the favorite that we have at the schools is the sugar snap and the snow peas. And there's actually, I'm experimenting with some varieties uh, due to having some vendor issues and not being able to get trellises in time, I started looking for bush um, snow peas that didn't need any trellis. And there is a variety from Burpee called Snowbird. And you don't need a trellis for that. And so you can get your sugar snap pea type snow pea. Um, I guess they're more of a snow pea um, without having a trellis. And so, and the other thing about the ones without trellises, because they're not spending their time trying to climb up that tall trellis, they are going to be, um, I just realized you're just looking at that thing. Y'all don't need to look at that anymore. Um, but because you're, it's not spending its time trying to climb up the pole or climb up the trellis, it's going to give you fruit sooner. And so you'll turn over that portion of the gardens faster because you'll have like a 60 day to harvest instead of a 75 day to harvest. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. And that's a really good point. And it took, it took me a while to realize that there's a difference between pole beans and bush meat beans and, you know, the, the ones that trail. I just thought it was the name of the bean. <laughs> right. All yeah, right. Someone asked me if the bush beans were like uh, uh, the ranch the, style. But, you're right. Uh, it, comes, it comes with a can, right? We've all seen the yeah, commercials with the dog. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Now we have a question about watermelon. Okay. My watermelons were growing fine this summer and they just burst open. What happened? So that's probably too much water. Um, you need very consistent water. And once that fruit starts to form, you actually kind of want to back it off so that it'll become sweeter. Um, watermelons, uh, I find that Texans overcompensate for how dry we are and you may not need as much water. And so your roots from your watermelon go way down deep. So don't just touch the top surface of your soil. You wanna dig your finger down in there. And most of the time I tell people go down about an inch and if it's wet an inch down, don't water. So that whole top inch could be completely dry and you don't need to water. But if it's um, dry at an inch or deeper, then you need to water. Good so tip, good tip with that. All right, so um, we also have a tour of the Dallas Seed Library we wanna add in. And so we're gonna get set up for that in just a moment. Now, I just wanna let everyone know that our session will be going past 1 p.m. We thank you for staying with us and we understand if you can't make it to the very end, remember this entire session will be on the Dallas Public Library YouTube page. Plus, if you registered, you will be able to access the entire recording and get anything that you missed. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Vanessa. Hi, thank you. Uh, let me get my screen shared here. Uh, let's see. All right, can everyone see that okay? So this Great. is a, a real quick short tour of if you were able to come to the <laughs> library, which you're not right now, this is what you would see. Um, and then uh, after I get done with this, uh, I'll let David tell you a little bit about how you can get seeds right now, um, the seed library. But this is what, if you could come in person, what you would see. Um, so this is kind of like this is a short virtual tour. Um, so our seed library is an old car catalog. I remember using these as a child. I don't know if anybody else remembers using these, but so they're divided into different types. Um, you'll notice the green stars and the green stars are the ones that are easy to save seeds from. So like your beans and your lettuces. And I apologize, I am not a cinematographer. So it's a little bit Blair Witchy here. Uh, <laughs> but let's say you just open up a drawer, you'll see the seed packets in there. Um, we do have donated seeds, but a lot of our ones we have available are commercially donated seeds. And we do, if you notice those brown envelopes, we do have brown envelopes because Don was talking about earlier about you don't probably need the whole seed packet for your 
to grow in your garden. So we ask that you just take the seeds that you need. So we have little envelopes in there that you can divide up and just write the information about um, what kind. So you see we have dill seeds here. Uh, we have tons of basil, <laughs> which is really easy to grow in Texas. Um, and then you see we also have dill seeds that people have saved. So if between the two, I would take the ones that people have saved if we know where they've been saved from because um, they've been locally grown and locally adapted, kind of like the ones Don saved. And this is from our seed swap that we had pre-COVID <laughs> for a couple of years. <laughs> Hopefully we'll be able to do this again next year um, when people just bring their seeds and swap. And again, just take what you need, kind of a way to get everyone to grow different things. So that was a lot of fun. Um, and the, we actually have two satellite seed library satellites, um, one at Lakewood and one at MLK library. And again, these are not currently open because <laughs> of COVID, but once we're open again, those are um, two other places you can get free seeds at is the Lakewood Library and the MLK Library. Uh, let's see. And if you're ever interested in donating seeds, again, right now, donating is a little bit tricky, um, but we do have a seed donation form that you can find on our website that I'll put in the chat in just a minute. And you can see here, we have a bunch of different seeds that were saved. I think this was from 2017, so those seeds were saved that year. Um, and again, if you get seeds from the seed library, we can't guarantee germination, but Don did an excellent job about telling you how you can test those seeds you get from the seed library and make sure that they're good and viable before you put them in your garden. So that's good. Um, we just ask that you put the basic information that you save the seeds from. And we also, you know, once, once we are able to do outreach again, we have a mobile um, seed library that we take in different things. And this is our book bike that oftentimes goes with the seed library. So a double whammy of eco-friendly there, book bike and <laughs> the library. Um, so hopefully, you know, eventually we'll have that around. And then this is the last one. This is when we get commercially donated seeds. Um, they're not always sorted. So this is <laughs> us having a lot of fun sorting seeds. And this is a great, uh, when we're able to have volunteers again, this is a great activity for volunteers. All right, so I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen here. Uh, and Davis, did you want to tell them a little bit about how they can get seeds right now? Sure. Hey, y'all, I'm Davis with the Seed Library. Um, so let me send out the email address. You guys are going to be um, sending any requests for uh, seeds to that email address and I'll be getting it. Um, I've got right now, we've got these kind of grab bags of frost tolerant seeds. Um, they're largely veggies um, that are ready to go. Uh, I can accommodate if you have specific or special requests we can see um, what, what we've got available. Um, we have this past year, we didn't get quite the windfall of donations that we've gotten in prior years. Um, so we'll see what, what is available um, and I'll accommodate kind of your requests as they come in. But we do, um, if you're interested in one of our sort of frost tolerant um, seed grab bags, uh, you can just shoot an email to um, the email address I just dropped there, that's seedlibrary at dallaslibrary2.org. That's the numeral two. Um, and uh, I will go ahead and get those on out to you. We'll just need your name, your uh, telephone number, and then um, which Dallas Public Library location you would like to pick them up at. Um, those are all things I'll kind of tell you in the email um, as we start to converse back and forth. Um, and that's about it for me. Uh, and there's a question about if we have Texas data plant seeds, I, I can tell you that we do not have a lot of those right now because we were looking for some for a program. Um, I believe those last year sometime, a lot of those got donated to another organization, I think is what happened. Uh, so we don't have a lot of those right now, but it's one of the things people like to donate. So when we're able to get more donations, hopefully we'll get more of those donated because people like to save those native seeds and give them to us. But right now we do not have a lot. Um, and how the it works when you request those is um, you'll also tell Davis what location you want those sent to you. And it will work like our curbside pickup. So um, once the branch receives those, they'll contact you about scheduling a pickup for those seeds. And you don't have to, you no. don't have to be in, no, no. <laughs> you just have to be able to come to a Dallas Public Library location to pick them up. We can't send them yeah. to you outside our Dallas Public Library location. All right, so Vanessa and Davis, just to make sure I got this straight, you're telling me that basically anybody can email seed library at dallaslibrary2.org and I can get free seeds. Is that correct? That's a fact. Yes. Yeah. You just, um, the, the, the only real drawback there, as Vanessa was saying, um, you just need to be able to pick them up from a Dallas Public Library location. 
Um, we're, we're not sending them out to like Irving libraries or anything like that. So as, as long as you are able to get to a Dallas Public Library branch to um, pick up your seeds, there'll be some free seeds waiting for you there. That is fantastic. Okay, and you mentioned that you have some prepared grab bags of, what did you call them, frost tolerant seeds? Yeah, they're they're um they're they're going to be kind of um sort of seeds that I think are uh, uh, seeds you want to start planting right now. I know we've got um, beets and radishes, a bunch of greens. Uh, we have a lot of kale, so um, you'll definitely be getting some kale, and um, just kind of a mixture of different other stuff. Uh, I know there might be some broccoli in there, some Brussels sprouts. Um, it'll be kind of different for each bag, so. Um, well, you know, a lot of people like surprises, so that's pretty cool. Now, uh, are you going to be moving to a different grab bag as the seasons change? Yes. Yeah, that's kind of my intention. Um, as the year progresses, we, we will be kind of offering different um, grab bags with, you know, seasonally appropriate seeds in them. That is fantastic. So the library, not only can I get my get all the information I need, whether it's books, ebooks, or virtual sessions like this, but I can also get seeds grow to feed my family. Yes, this sir, is sir. fantastic. And this is all provided for uh, everybody for free. So I want to thank you both very much. I have personally not seed, seen the seed uh, hard catalog. And I do remember those. I, re I remember those uh, <laughs> quite well from when I was in school. And uh, so that is awesome. I appreciate you sharing that with us and this fantastic resource that people honestly don't know about. So now I have a question. A couple questions for Dawn. So okay. Dawn, we had a question about potatoes, about um, like red versus white versus sweet potatoes and growing those. And then also, I think, um, are you going to be doing a, maybe another seed giveaway? And also, if somebody wanted to help you at one of these school gardens, how can they do that? Okay, so let me start with the volunteers and keep me on track so I hit all these points. You just rattled off a couple. I did, I did. Uh, so volunteers, I am got permission to do volunteers both in person and virtual uh, from the district. So we're doing two in-person types of volunteers. One is a regular occurring thing that's going to be at all of my schools. Most of them are actually in the city of Dallas, even though they're Richardson ISD. And it's going to be a one hour work session. You're not allowed in the building. You have to you know, have your temperature taken and fill out a form and wear a mask. But we're going to work in the gardens to help maintain these gardens so these kids can still have their wonderful gardens. And the other opportunity is garden magic volunteers. So this is a training program where I teach a group how we do our garden magic for our schools because sometimes our kids do interesting things with their seeds and somebody has to magically come in there as a fairy or whatever and fix it. And so when the kindergarten goes out there and they plant all of their carrots and they all come up in one square foot, but they have this eight foot bed that needs to have carrots, we go plant the carrots in the rest of the eight foot bed. And if they got the season wrong, their carrots might change into beans, who knows? Um, but we kind of go and fix their gardens and make sure there's something growing for them to see and be excited about. And so I will be doing four training sessions for that it's on Volley. If you um, are signed up, you'll get the link and then we can uh, get you signed up to do that. There are some also that seed sorting. I did that last week all by myself. It was so much fun. Um, so I'm going to have a virtual volunteer opportunity for people to sort the seeds that I have. Um, I am looking to do grab bags for kids to take home to grow at home. And some of these seeds that I still have left after having given the schools their gardens are gonna go directly to kids to grow at home. And I'm gonna need lots of hands and I will make a package. I will drop it off. If you want, you don't have to touch it for four days or whatever you, the COVID, I don't touch it because someone else touched it. Then you can sort them, then you can give them, set them out somewhere and I'll come pick them up. Um, so we'll, I'll be organizing that. Okay, now, so those volunteer opportunities are coming along. Um, now back to the questions. Help me out here, Helen. <laughs> All right, it's about potatoes. Potatoes, uh, yes. Right. So potatoes, we are getting ready. First grade does potatoes in RISD in any of my school gardens. So potatoes for school gardens starting now, you cheat them now, which is basically a, a word for sprouting them. And these are Idaho potatoes. 
And potatoes have a variety, just like tomatoes have, um, now I can't remember the word, uh, determinate and indeterminate, I believe is the word. Um, but there's different lengths of growing seasons. So there's an early potato plant and a later potato plant. And we have a short season because it's gonna get too hot. So we're gonna look for things that have a short season. Now, most of your garden centers don't actually know the difference of short season or long season, but luckily whoever ordered the potatoes there, most of them have already calculated that. So most of what your garden centers, even your big box store garden centers have either early or um, intermediate length potatoes. So those will be good potatoes to go plant. You're gonna hold them inside in a warm place with sunlight from whenever you buy them till February 15th. On February 15th, you plant them in the ground. And for the schools, we harvest them right at the end of the school year, end of May. Um, if you're growing them yourself at home and you wanna wait a little longer, you can and you might get some bigger potatoes. Sweet potatoes, however, you're gonna get, if you're gonna sprout your own, you're going to get your, your beginning potato, which hopefully you found a gardener who saved one for you, or you can buy them at the organic um, grocery store, you just don't want to buy a conventional one. It's been sprayed with inhibitors, but you can take those. I put them in soil. Everybody sees the cut it in half, stick the toothpicks in it and set it in a glass of water. That's kind of marginal on your success. It does work, but they're not the best sprouts. So the best sprouts come when you lay the potatoes sideways in soil, about six inches deep in a container in a warm spot, sprout them. Then you'll be able to break off those sprouts put them in water, they'll get roots, put them in the garden. And you put those, uh, I should probably check my chart, but I believe you put those in the garden uh, late April, May. And those will grow great here. You do need to watch out for the, um, the weevil, the sweet potato weevil, which if you have a lot of those weeds that are the morning glory weed, that is the same family. And the morning glory weed will hold over the weevil. So, um, you will know it because you will have little worms in your potatoes when you harvest them. Um, but you want to make sure when you do harvest, you get all the roots out of the soil. Otherwise, you're going to continue their life cycle. And you want to make sure you rotate your crops for your sweet potatoes. Those are good points. Okay, so Don, uh, what about the sweet potato leaves? The what? The leaves? Oh, yes. You can eat the sweet potato leaves. Yes, I've been teaching people that. I learned that from my garden mentor, Don Lambert. Um, you cut off the tips. Or you break it, you know how some people will say, if you can break something, then it's edible. If you can't break it, it's too fibrous. Well, I learned the hard way about which part was too fibrous and it will stick in your teeth really well. So you wanna break it and uh, get the short ends of the tips of the ends of the vines and the leaves can go into like a stir fry or a saute or something early or no, the vine goes in first because it's harder and you wanna cook it more and the leaves go in last because they just need to be delicately wilt wilted. Is that right? I'm not a cook, I'm a gardener. <laughs> That's all right. Yes, you're absolutely correct on that. And they are delicious. It's kind yeah. of like, like really good spinach in a way. And it, they're beautiful too. They have the, the pretty veins and the, the dark green leaf and they're, they're also very beautiful. All right. So we also had a, a person asking a little bit about loofah. So this person has never tasted loofah before. And I know I have, but what is it like for you, Don, when you eat loofah? For me, it's a bland zucchini. Um, I made the mistake of trying to serve it to my family who's never had loofah before. And I just sauteed it up and gave it absolutely plain with a little bit of salt. I don't recommend that. I recommend throw it in there with your uh, curry, throw it in with your stir fry, throw it in with your spaghetti. Um, it's something that likes to be mixed with other stuff, I believe, for a American palate. Um, what about you, Helen? What kind of things do you cook it with? Yeah, so I, I agree. And um, the other thing is sometimes, depending on like what bread you have, it has like really big seeds and they are not, don't eat the seeds. Oh, so you no. definitely need to scoop out the center, uh, scoop out the center of it and get those seeds out and then you can save them and donate them to the seed library or, you uh, know, you give them to your friends and different things like that. Are ready yet. <laughs> and um, so I agree that they are not super tasty and they do great mixed in with other things. Uh, Dawn had some really creative ways on how to use it, but yeah, putting it in different stir fries. Uh, they also do really well in soups and stews. So if you're looking for something to bulk up your soups and stews, uh, you can definitely add those in there. And I, um, 
I like those. I like actually like long squash even better. I don't know if people are familiar with that, but I like those even better. But then uh, I love using the loofah as the loofah itself, you know, like drying it out. Like Dawn showed us how she got the seats from. I like using them for cleaning. I use them to wash my dishes because they're, they don't scratch my, my pans, you know, the coating on my pans. I even use them to clean my shower. Uh, I use them on myself, you know, as a scrub on my body. And you know what, when, when they start getting kind of old and falling apart, I just toss them in the compost. So I love, I love to eat them. And I also love to, to clean with them too. So I think they're fantastic and they're easy to grow. They're fun. You, know, you can trellis them and walk underneath them. They have the, the pretty flowers and they hang down and it's almost, you know, they're a huge success. You know, it, just about anybody can, can grow those. So they're fantastic. So if you haven't tried it, give it a try. All right, so Don, we did have a couple, uh, we have somebody who is interested in volunteering with you. Uh, awesome. And how, how, how can they reach out to you or how can they get that information for volunteering? So dawn.cleaves at risd.org is my email address and you are welcome to email me directly. Um, the other thing you can do is if you're registered for the course, we will put the link to register on Volley, which is the background check for working with our students. Um, and that will, uh, once you get that, you will get the links to the volunteer opportunities. I'm still learning the software, so bear with me. Um, email me a reminder if you don't hear from me. <laughs> but we're, I, I'm learning how it works and getting it going, and it's great to have help. Um, and the kids just love it. And um, I started out as a garden volunteer with my kids' school, and I volunteered doing their garden for five years before I started doing this as a job. That, so it's also a great way to learn um, how to garden because you see all the mistakes at a school garden, <laughs> but also mistakes don't matter because everybody's making mistakes. So it's a really low entry to gardening that there's, there's no, no mistakes. Any level of gardener is welcome. We just love to have you. It's a great place to learn. Absolutely. And so last question before we wrap up is do you have recommendations for uh, vegetables to grow if you have shade? Shade, you really want to get your sun. Um, beets and kale are supposed to be better, but that's saying that they want six hours, okay? Anything below six hours and it's going to struggle. I have watched people plant lettuce and go, oh, but they said it'll grow in the shade. And lettuce is supposed to take 60 days to harvest and their lettuce took six months to harvest and it did not look pretty, it was very yellow. So I would suggest find a pot and move it to where the sun is. Um, garden with a friend, garden at a school garden that has sun that's set up right, not all of them are. Um, and, but go find yourself some sun because you're, it, it feels nice to be successful and sometimes growing in the shade, um, we just turned one of our school gardens from a vegetable garden in the shade to a pollinator calming peaceful garden in the shade because it just wasn't worth the effort to try to go grow vegetables and the kids love it and it's instead we have fern we have uh oak leaf hydrangeas we have um side oats we have beauty berry bushes and it's a much better use of your sh shade area Go, go garden with friends that have sun. Good advice. Uh, shade can be a challenge, but we sure do love it in the summertime. Yes. <laughs> so um, I just want to remind everybody about our next Grow With Us session on February 1st. It's going to be a, uh, a, a way for us to honor Black History Month. We're going to feature a panel of five different urban agriculture leaders uh, and a special moderator. And they're gonna be talking about the black and indigenous contributions to agriculture. So we're really excited to have that panel on Monday, February 1st. Um, also in February, we're gonna be featuring the George Bush Presidential Library Garden because uh, February is also uh, President's Day is in February. Now the Dallas Public Library and the city of Dallas are closed on President's Day. So the week before President's Day, we're gonna have that special virtual tour of uh, the Bush Library Garden, and it's going to be led by one of their docents, and it's going to feature some of the edibles they have, but also the native plants. So it's like, it is a complete Texas native formal garden there at the Bush Library, and we're really excited about that. And um, 
Vanessa is dropping those links to register for those sessions. And if you are on our Zoom, if you don't mind, please filling out this short survey. I think it's only three questions. It will help us with future programming. And Dawn, you have lots and lots of thank yous and thank yous uh, for the great information you shared today. I have to admit that every time I talk to you, I learn something. And um, we are so thankful to have you here with us today. And so with that, we're going to be wrapping up. I want to thank everyone for spending their time with us today. I want to thank our speaker, Don. I want to thank all my friends at the Dallas Public Library. I hope that you get lots of requests for free seeds. I hope everyone can take advantage of the seed library. And everyone, please stay safe. And I'll see you back on February 1st. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Don. Thanks, Helen. Thanks, Vanessa.